The objective of this video is to review the bridge converter and to use it to motivate high frequency transformer design and finally to examine example transformer components. So again we're in the magnetics unit of this course and the later portion of this lecture, not this video but the second video, is going to talk about high frequency transformer design. But before we get there let's talk about why we would even think about high frequency transformers. And to do this, I'm going to take you back to uh, two units ago, where we concluded by introducing the full bridge converter. And as you recall, we had a schematic that looks something like this. And our full bridge converter consisted of two single pole double throw converters connected to the same throw. And the idea was that we could operate each single pole double throw converter with a separate duty ratio so that we can create an output voltage between the two poles. So if we label our output voltage as I have just done and our throw voltage, we can note that we could, for example, have our first pole have a duty ratio of 0.9, which would mean that our pole voltage would be 0.9 times our throw voltage, while our second pole has a duty ratio of 0.1, which would mean that its output voltage is 0.1 times our throw voltage, which would give us an actual output voltage of 0.8 times our throw voltage. Our actual output voltage would be VP1 minus VP2, which would give us 0.8 times our throw voltage. And we can reverse this, so we can have VP1 equal to 0.1 times our throw voltage while VP2 is equal to 0.9 times our throw voltage, and that results in a negative output voltage. So the point of this was that by connecting these two single pole double throw converters to the same throw, we could have bidirectional output voltages. So this allowed us to create AC or DC at this point in the circuit. We talked about this in the context of a DC throw voltage, and we noted that we can have our throw voltage be either a source, in which case the quantity in the center here is a load, or we could have our throw voltage be the load, and the quantity in the center would then be a source. And so if the quantity in the center is an AC source and we have a DC load, we're talking about a rectifier circuit. And we had noted that for this circuit, we can never have an output voltage that is larger than our throw voltage. That's because our two pole voltages are always a fraction of our throw voltage. They can at most be equal to the throw voltage. Because remember, the single pole double throw switch is a voltage divider in an average sense. So you can't possibly have your pole voltage being larger than your throw voltage because that would imply that your pole is somehow connected to throw one more than 100% of the time, which is not possible. So we noted that the that the output of this converter is always less than or equal to our throw voltage. And so we've now come across our first motivation for going to, for using a high frequency transformer. We can get around this limitation if we connect a transformer in place of the load or in place of the source, then you'd have, have power flow the other direction. So if we place a transformer here, and the transformer has some NP turns and some NS turns. We can note that while V out primary, VOP must be less than or equal to our throw voltage, our V out secondary can actually be any ratio. It can actually be any voltage, uh, depending on how we design our transformer. So if we design our transformer with a turns ratio that amplifies our output voltage of our bridge converter, we can get an output from our transformer that is larger than the bridge converter throw voltage. So in other words, the transformer, the transformer removes the voltage constraint. So we can say that our first motivation for adding a high frequency transformer is to remove this voltage constraint to allow an output voltage from our full bridge converter which is larger than our throw voltage. And our second motivation for designing a high frequency transformer, and this is where the high frequency part comes in, 
is that it turns out that the size of the transformer is inversely proportional to the switching frequency of our converter. And so we'll talk about this in the design video, but this is a major motivating factor. In fact, this is such a driving force that if you take apart uh, a cell phone charger or some, some power supply that you plug directly into the wall, you are not going to see a 60 hertz transformer. Instead, you're going to see a topology that, that resembles this, though it may not be exactly this full bridge topology, but you're going to go, you're going to have the following power flow. You're going to go from a wall AC unit. So this is your, this is your plug um, going into the wall, and that is going to be rectified to DC. And that will be rectified using the kind of circuit we talked about in the very beginning of the class, but without a transformer in front of it. So it'll just be a diode bridge rectifier. And then that is going to become the throw voltage for an inverter that's going to chop this up into high frequency AC, which is then going to be fed to a transformer. And in this case, the transformer is likely actually dropping the voltage down. If you're trying to get a five volt supply from a 120 volt wall outlet, you're not increasing the, the rectified voltage in the wall outlet, you're going to be reducing it. And then finally, when you want that five volts, you're going to rectify it again, so you'll get DC. So notice that this looks like far more steps than were involved with the, 60, with the simple 60 hertz single phase rectifiers we talked about at the beginning of class. But it turns out that we can make use of this size advantage in order to actually save ourselves a considerable amount of volume and weight, as well as cost. Since we know that a transformer scales this way, we can observe that the 20 volt ampere transformers that we were talking about in the beginning of class that we could look up in DigiKey, the 60 hertz 20 volt ampere transformers, so these are approximately 20 watts, will be the same size as a 20,000 volt ampere transformer that is operated at 60 kilohertz. So we get this theoretical improvement of a thousand times power increase for the same size of transformer. So that 20 volt ampere transformer that you bought from DigiKey for, uh, that operates at 60 hertz is about the size of your fist. And in that case, only about 20 watts can go through it. But if you were to design a high frequency transformer that can switch at 60 kilohertz, suddenly you can send about 20 kilowatts through that same form factor. Now, this is a theoretical observation, and in practice it won't actually be this extreme. Maybe you get 500 times power density improvement. But the point is, is that you get major, major power density improvements. And we'll talk about why that is as we get into the design video. And in order to actually realize these, these power density improvements, you have to become familiar with the design process for the transformer. Theoretically, we get this this improvement of a thousand times power density, but in actuality we don't achieve it because of things like the insulation on our, our coils, how we place the coils in the window area of the transformer, the bobbins that we use to wind, um, thermal issues. And so for these systems, um, to be a practicing power engineer, you really have to learn at least the basics of the design process so that you can make informed decisions when you want to build these things. So right now you can go on DigiKey and you can buy 60 Hertz transformers that are that are of this size rating approximately. Uh, if you're in Europe you can buy 50 Hertz transformers and then you can also get 400 Hertz transformers and this is due to the aviation industry. But if you want to get a 60 kilohertz transformer or a 20 kilohertz transformer you're typically out of luck. You typically will have to go design your own. Now there are some companies that will make custom transformers for you, but even when you use these companies, it still is, is uh, nearly necessary to become familiar with the design process so you understand the constraints that go into coming up with a, a reasonable transformer. So now what I wanna do is I wanna show some images of, uh, of example transformer components that we have in our, our storage room here in the lab to give you a feel for what this looks like. So the first class of components I'm, I'm showing here are called split cores. And these are actually the cores that, that a coil will be wound on. 
So if we go left to right, we can say that this is a C core because it's shaped like a C. Here we have an E core. And finally, we have an I core. And these three cores are different sizes. But when you go to use these cores, uh, they're called split cores because they actually are two cores that are split in half. So if you're trying to use the I core, or you might put it next to a C core so that you have an I core right here that's in physical contact with a C core. And the, the point of them being split is that you can take a plastic bobbin and install a winding on and then slip that bobbin over this I core before you press it up against the C core. And so similarly, I just gave that example for the C core, but you can do the same thing here with an E core. You could take an I core and put it next to it. You could take a second E core and, and put them back to back. Um, so if you, if you had two E cores, well, I'm going to show you an example of two, two E cores next. So these, these cores here are all um, magnetic steel, uh, perhaps a ferrite material, and they are what you wrap a winding around. Moving downwards, now I've got two E cores, and I'm showing you an example bobbin. So this is one E core, and here's a second E core. And when you, it, and this part right here is, is a plastic bobbin. So when you want to wind your transformer, you wind this bobbin. So you can take that completely off these cores, you put, in, put it in a, a coil winding machine, you put a certain number of, a known number of turns on it, you take it off the coil winding machine and now you can slide it onto these E-cores. So here you can see on the right side, we've slid the bobbin on between the two E-cores. And so, you know, if this thing was set up, you had a winding on, you'd have a, a coil coming in and around and it, it'd be wrapped around here and coming back out. And now you need to put some kind of retention band on this core to hold it together. And you can see that we've got, there's a notched pattern here that a band can fit within to, to compress the two cores and, and hold them physically in contact. Because you want this, this region where they meet, you want the steel or the, the iron to be perfectly in contact at that point because you don't want any air gap. If you have an air gap, that's going to decrease your magnetizing inductance, it's going to increase your leakage. So we have an example here of of what this looks like when it's all wound up. And um, so in this case, this is two E cores and you can see here's our, here's our bobbin, right? And we've got our, our, our coil coming out. And this point right here is where the two E cores are in contact. So this should give you a little bit of a feeling for uh, what transformers look like in practice. And when we talk about this in class, I'm going to bring some items in for you to see firsthand. So we'll have a little show and tell. And in summary, this video has been a motivating video, uh, first reviewing the full bridge converter and then talking about why you would want to connect a transformer to it. And the reasons can be either because you want to get a larger output voltage than your throw voltage or because you want to decrease the size of your converter. And I should note that for small converters, like you might use to charge your cell phone, you typically actually don't have this exact full bridge topology here. You have a topology that uses a reduced component count. And we'll show some examples of that in, in later lectures.